So if you join me, I have to do a uh, Holy Spirit booster energy drink for me. And so uh, please join me in prayer. Holy God, send your spirit down. Help us to open our minds and our hearts to new understandings. Guide my words and my tongue that they might be pleasing to you, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So, and when I preached on this before, uh, I remember one of my sermon titles was Martha, Martha, Martha from the, <laughs> from the Brady Bunch, uh, but I'm going a different direction uh, this time. So uh, we're going to be talking about hangry, hangry. So anyway, this time of year always makes me think of my family vacations when I was younger. We'd always, my father would have off at the beginning of August, and so we'd always travel in late late July, early August, and we would, 99% of our trips were to California, Southern California. Sometimes we'd go to Nevada. And I remember we'd leave really early in the morning to get through the desert. That horrible, awful desert from Gila Bend to the mountains right before San Diego. The ones where you see all the big uh, tubs of water along endless desert, endless, endless. And what was even worse is going from Las Vegas, or from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. I always remember the Las Vegas trips. We got to spend a couple of days in a hotel room with my grandmother while my parents got to go out. And so, um, but it was always such an ordeal crossing that desert. And I remember once, and Patty's heard this story, that um, we were... <laughs> in our dusty station wagon. And this is late 60s Las Vegas. And uh, we pull up to the front of Caesar's Palace and our car just goes plop and overheats. And my dad's in the front with the hood up and like he's getting water from the fountains of Saint of uh, Caesar's Palace to, to put, put in the, the valets. are like, you gotta get out of here. So, but it was, it was always uh, such, such an ordeal. And you know, traveling is perilous. I mean, many of you uh, who travel, and it doesn't have to be during summer, it can be during the holidays, it's always a big ordeal whether you go by car or train, if you go by train or, or airplane. And at least for me, it's always good to get to that place of welcome, that place of rest, especially when you're crossing the desert and you open the door and turn on the air conditioner in the, in the hotel room, just kind of lay on the bed for a minute. That's always wonderful. And so God reinforces this idea of needing rest from a journey. In ancient Western and South Central Asia, hospitality was extremely important as it was in the Mediterranean world. And I'm just going to focus on those areas right now because that there's welcome across the world. But right now I want to do that part of um, Western and, and uh, South Central Asia and, and the Mediterranean. And this is where we find Abram and Sarah later, Sarai later, Abraham and Sarah. And there are three reasons why it's so important with hospitality. One, you don't know who's visiting you. These could be supernatural beings. And you don't know whether they're angels, messengers, gods. In the letter to the Hebrews, the author says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some have entertained angels without knowing it. It's one of my favorite passages. If we switch to the Greco-Roman world, ancient Greek gods had a way of dropping in on mortals to eat or bless or engage or test. Sometimes they would engage in some not-so-nice escapades. And Greek stories were filled with encounters of humans and divinity. And your hospitality, the hospitality of the, the human, could mean life or death. And for example... <laughs> Bad hospitality on the part of Tantalus um, caused him to be put into, uh, into the underworld, always out of reach of food. 
And that's because he stole ambrosia from Zeus's table and he served his son to the gods uh, to see whether they would notice, and they did. So this comes into the concept, the ancient Greek concept of xenia, which is hospitality, which has two rules. The host respects the guest, and the guest respects the host. And then lastly, hospitality was crucial because you never know when you would be in the situation, when you would be the traveler and you would need help. You know, Abram and Sarai had recently uprooted themselves from a life of stability in Ur and became travelers. And so now they are set up, Abraham and Sarah, and they are, um, they are now the hosts. So this is the story of divine visitors, and I love it that they mention Abraham was there during the hottest part of the day. So imagine being out in a tent, maybe in Tucson Mountain Park somewhere, the hottest part of the day, and you have your camping gear, you have your supplies, and then some people show up. What's your first impulse? Yep, take a nap or maybe go zip. So. But Abraham, I love his enthusiasm. He goes running out to them and bows down. He's so excited, and he invites them in. Well, he asks if, if they would partake of his hospitality, which is deferring to them. And then he invites them in, and he just gets the whole house going. He greets them. He gives them water. He washes their feet. He asks Sarah to go get the finest flour and start making bread. Sets the meat roasting. Sets out fresh milk and, and curds, which is cheese. And the guests are just treated so well by Abraham, and he did not miss a beat in his hospitality. And so the first question that comes from these guests is not... What you do? A nice place you got here? Or, wow, what's the recipe? It's where is your wife, Sarah? She's behind the scenes, but she is doing all the work. Abraham is, to quote um, Charles Dickens, is the founder of the feast, but it's Sarah who is the preparer of the feast. She's the one who's managing the household and making sure, you know, go, go pour some milk, go set the curds out, set the table, get this all going. And so she is essential, but she is behind the scenes. And these visitors call her out, recognize her, and say that she's going to have a baby, which is a whole nother story. But she is the model of what Jewish hospitality was in the ancient world. You just go all out, and it was her responsibility, her place. She did the right thing. And she, you know, she wouldn't have gotten recognition if these visitors hadn't mentioned it. And just as a sideline, um, you know, who these visitors are, it's, it, some, some say they're angels, some say that they are um, the Trinity, uh, that they are God. So, you know, it's hard to tell. But hospitality in this part of the story is essential. And actually it becomes kind of a foil when later on these visitors go to a place called Sodom. And the sin of Sodom is not about anything else besides hospitality that is bad, really bad, violent. And so that's another story. So this is what we're set up with as Sarah is the model of this, you know, sort of Hebrew, Judeo, Greco-Roman hospitality. Now we come to Martha and Mary. And I love this story because, you know, we know about Martha and Mary 
And Lazarus, Lazarus always mentioned, but he is not mentioned once in this. And it's Martha who engages Jesus and goes out to bring him in. So I, I always wonder, like, is this before Lazarus got into the story? Was it Martha who brought Jesus into their, into their midst? We don't know. We can speculate. Martha's the elder sister. She's responsible for the house. And then there's the relationship of the sisters. Mary's the younger sister. So we get in the story, and Martha's busy doing all the good things like Sarah was doing in the earlier story. And Mary is sitting, listening to Jesus, engaged. Now, by tradition, she should be helped. Once again, like I talked about in the, the Samaritan, you know, it's like there's the right thing to be doing and then there's going beyond. And she's doing that right now. She's going beyond. The expected thing is that she would be in the kitchen helping her sister. But she's not. And this is where Mary, Martha comes out angry. And I love what she says to Jesus. She doesn't yell at Mary and say, Mary, you need to help me. She goes to Jesus and she says, Lord, make her help me. She's not doing what she should be doing. Make her help me. So Mary is sitting there engaged and Martha is trying to fit her back into this traditional role, which really is not Martha's place. Have you seen those Snickers commercials about hangry? If you're hangry, it's usually like some sort of out of control uh, pop star. And they're like, oh, you need, you need a, a Snickers bar because you're hangry. And they give it to him, and then the person turns uh, back into the regular cells. That's why I say Martha is in this story, but she's hangry from her soul. Hungry and angry. She has a hunger in her soul, and it is not fulfilling. Her soul is hangry. It needs rest. It needs action. It needs to refocus. It needs purpose beyond task. It needs joy in doing and she doesn't have any of that and i've always said martha's role is crucial it is central but what's happening is she's letting her her hangry state draw her attention away from this essential crucial i'm going to call it a ministry her role in the house her role as helping Prepare the place where Mary and Jesus can engage. We don't know what's drawing her away. I don't know if she's envious. If she thinks that her sister, as a first century Jewish woman, was shirking her duty and she needed to be put back in her place. I don't know. But it's distraction. It's distraction. She has a beautiful thing that she is doing, a gift but it's distracted. She's distracted by Mary's relationship with Jesus. And in doing so, she's ruining her gift of hospitality. Because she's one, she's putting Jesus in the middle of this. Is that a good guest or a good host? She talks to Jesus and said, Jesus, Lord, make her do this. So it's putting Jesus right in the middle. She's also trying to usurp Jesus' authority. Ever remember when you're kids? Well, Dad said, Mom said, or if you really want to go up, Grandma said, the thing that Martha doesn't realize is that this is not regular life. The mere fact that Jesus was invited in has changed the whole dynamic. 
Jesus' way transforms. It is not just a guest in your house. This is inviting Jesus in to engage, to be, and that's what Mary is doing. Now, you might argue, well, Martha, by her task, is not able to enjoy that, that Mary is privileged uh, to do that. But if Martha was able to break away from these traditional views, she would be able to sit there too and just say, Lord, dinner's going to be a little late. Or, I ordered takeout. (laughs) But when we're working in old patterns like Martha is, the thing that, that Martha's doing that's wrong is she's trying to force them back onto Mary. And that's not right. So Jesus gently refocuses Martha and reminds her that, you know, there's a time to do what you're doing, but engaging, listening, connecting, resting is the better part. Because Martha, in her frustration and tiredness and anger, has turned out to change what should be a gift into a task. And she is resentful. Nothing kills the soul faster than resentment and fatigue. In my previous life, I worked in a, a program with fifth graders And before that, I had another job with an educational institution. And I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. But as the years went by, my job there became more task-driven. And more responsibilities kept being put on me without any sort of creativity or, or engagement with that. And from these tasks, and there were more reports less engagement, more meetings, less connection with students and my staff of student aides. And I remember literally driving into work one day because it took me 20 minutes, and I was waiting at a stoplight, and my hands were clenched on the steering wheel. And then I felt on the side of my head this, like, my, my eye was twitching. And all of a sudden, I just realized, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I just let my hands go. Did my best to stop the twitch. And that day, I decided, you need to live differently. You need to move in a different direction because this is not nourishing and affirming. And I did check with Patty and I put my notice in and something even better came up. And uh, that had its life because then that became, er. (laughs) so anyway, it led me here. Once I left there, I was able to become a Christian education director at another church and then finally end up called clergy here but it's about recognizing those moments when you're just mm, and you you're in a rut you're angry like i said worse you're resentful one of the worst times was when a a student (laughs) came in and i got up from my desk from my office and my first impulse wasn't i didn't say this to them i was very kind but my impulse when I got up, was like, oh, no, what do you want? And that isn't a good thing. So, so as I mentioned as na- ad nauseum, right now we are in very challenging times, challenging places. I'm going to label them off again. Pandemic never-ending COVID variants, high cost of living, war in Ukraine, political rhetoric, lies and manipulations. And it's stressful. We get jaded. We get tired. 
How long, O oh Lord? But they're distractions. They are distractions. And like Martha, we are stressed and we are tired. But the important thing is when Jesus is invited into our house, we cannot be disconnected. We can't be disconnected from one another. We cannot be disconnected from God. That is the key. It's funny, what comes into my head right now is Patty got an earful on, uh, I believe it was Saturday morning, about my big bowl of gripes. None of it around here. But just the state of the world. This morning, in connection with God, in connection with all of you, with you in the cyber world, I feel uplifted and purposed. Thank you. So I mentioned before that this story has been used to pit back and forth. Is it the active life? Is it the contemplative life? You'll see tons of Renaissance paintings of Mary and, and Martha and, you know, which one is better? Are you active? Are you supposed to be out in the world doing justice and preaching and evangelizing? Or do you go the quiet contemplative life where you're in a monastery praying all the time? What do you do? Well, it's not one or the other. How about both? How about an active and a contemplative life? How about prayers and action? It's not about which side you choose. It's about your priorities. It's about your passion. It's about your hunger. It's about what is nourishing you. What junk food is coming into your life? And I'm not talking about um, Quick Trip or Circle K stuff. I'm talking about junk food that, that is just pouring down like rain right now in our social networks, in our news. Are you using that to nourish you? Or are you using it to be pulled down and weary? So, in light of active and contemplative, as we finish this up, I want to ask, are we connecting or are we disengaging? Are we welcoming? Are we criticizing? Are we telling? Or are we doing? Are we trying to gain power or the upper hand through usurped, corrupted divine authority? Or are we letting God work through us and our community honestly? As Jesus is invited into our lives, the Jesus way, we are inevitably transformed. We are changed from old ways. We're shifted to new paths. We're still bound by some basic human connection patterns that God has set up by love, but we're not forced into old roles. And Jesus makes it clear by affirming Mary at his feet listening. So, are you taking care of your souls hungry? Are you feeling hangry? Let's take a moment together right now just to stop and listen.
Now, why do you do that thing that you do? Amen.